and you get a flash drive, and you get a flash drive, and you get a flash drive. It's time to dig in the old mailbag. I've gotten a ton of new specialty boards all powered by this, the tiny Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. This Raspberry Pi is a bit different. Instead of USB and HDMI, it has these two board-to-board -board connectors on the bottom so people can turn the Raspberry Pi into any kind of computer. Pretty cool. Today, I'll show you a few new ones like the 52 Pi router board and this, the Pi Gear Nano with eight USB 3 ports, a slot for a 4G modem, industrial I.O., and even an M2 NVMe slot on the bottom. As always, links to everything in this video are in the description. Diving right in, I got this package from Marek in Poland, and Marek made the Miracle PC, which I reviewed last year. Now, there's this updated version with a really cool 3D printed case to match, and a bunch of improvements over the prototype I tested. There's a new power switch up front, two more fan headers, and this one right here has PWM fan control, but the best thing is he fixed the annoying power issues I had when I was testing my NVMe SSDs on it. For more on the Mirko PC, check out my video from last year, linked in the card right up there. It looks like he also sent along this bag of Polish candy. When I looked up these things, they're called Krauka, and that apparently means little cows. Pretty good. <clears throat> so, yeah, if you're wondering why Marek's stuff got mentioned first, it's bribery. Anyways, he also sent along two other boards, including this tiny little Picoberry. It's literally a GPIO header and a power plug. That's it. It won't work with light CM4 modules because there's not even a card slot. But I did test it, and it works great for those times when you literally just need power on a CM4 and maybe use serial debugging or a Pi Hat or Wi Fi. Going halfway between the full-featured Miracle PC and the tiny Picoberry is the Bit Pirate, or maybe it's supposed to be pronounced Bit Pirate? Not sure. But in any case, this board is tiny, yet still manages to fit a full-size 2280 M.2 NVMe slot for an SSD on the bottom. And there's actually a ton of I.O. on the top, too, so you could use it in a lot of different ways. I think this board might be best suited for projects where you just need some good persistent NVMe storage, and remember, you can even boot the Pi directly off an NVMe drive now, with a caveat. More on that later. Moving on from Poland, this next company didn't send me any chocolates, but they did send this neat dual router board with a built-in OLED display, which integrates with OpenWRT and can show you server stats and IP addresses. It's 52 Pi's CM4 router board, and it has two gigabit Ethernet ports, a full-size HDMI port, a USB 2 port on the front, a full GPIO header, and this nice little built-in OLED display. 52 Pi ships their own fork of OpenWRT, which is great if you want to run the board as a router, but I did have some trouble with it. They use this little Realtek PCI chip for the second gigabit port, but the first version of their custom image didn't even have the driver for it pre-installed. So I installed PyOS instead because just last week, support for Realtek network chips was added directly to PyOS. That's really cool because it means even other boards, like the DF Robot one I reviewed last year, and the Taco with its 2.5 gig port, will work right out of the box with PyOS with no extra driver install. Once I got both ports working, I did some benchmarking. Using iPerf3, I measured each port's throughput, and both ports gave me 940 megabits, which is the maximum real-world speed you can get on a gigabit port, so there are no bottlenecks there. I also used HPing to send as many tiny packets as quickly as possible through the WAN port, and it could handle about 63,000 packets per second. That's not quite as good as the chip used in the DF Robot board, which handled almost 76,000 PPS, but it is a lot better than the Seed router board that used a USB to Ethernet adapter and could only put through about 37,000 PPS. Finally, I did a test putting through as much data as I could through both network ports continuously and found out the second gigabit NIC gets really hot. So hot that if you don't add a heatsink or a fan, it'll actually slow down. My first run went from pumping through 1.76 gigabits to just 1.2. After I put this little Pi fan on the board, I was able to get 1.8 gigabits without any slowdown. So it performs adequately, and any other networking performance issues, like using it as a VPN or firewall, would come down to the Pi's own CPU performance, just like the other boards I reviewed last year. Right before I shot this video, though, 52Pi actually updated their official OpenWRT image, so I grabbed it and flashed it to the board, and what do you know? The driver for the second port is actually included, so I could use both network ports to build a router in OpenWRT. 
But software bugs aside, the other headline feature that got me excited about this board in particular is the ability to use power over ethernet instead of USB to power it. That means you could just have a couple ethernet cables plugged into it and no need for an extra power supply. These dip switches should let me choose which port the PoE power goes through, and all I'd need to do is add a PoE hat, in theory. Unfortunately, no amount of installing drivers or recompiling kernels gets past the problem that PoE support on this board is just broken. I tried two different PoE switches on both ports with two different working PoE hats, and no matter what, I couldn't get this board to power itself using power over ethernet. And it's not just me. Nobody else I've seen is able to get it working either, so that was a bit disappointing. So if you're okay without PoE, at least not with the version of the board that's out right now, the board makes a decent router otherwise. Switching gears a bit, I got this little box a few months ago, but haven't had time to test the fun things inside. It was sent by Nikolai in Germany, and it has the PiCam. This is made by Tasket, and they make a number of embedded products for IoT systems. The PiCam system is based around this tiny board which works with EMMC compute modules and exposes its camera interface on the opposite side. Adafruit actually sells the board by itself for 40 bucks in the US, and you can find it internationally through Lodato. But they sent me a few pre-built kits. The first one has a Pi Camera V2, the second one has a high quality camera, and the third one has this funky night vision camera with adjustable focus. Their setup is pretty cool. If you use their software, it'll boot up as a Wi-Fi hotspot. You log into it, then go to a predefined IP address and put in your Wi-Fi password. This is kind of useful because this board sacrifices connectivity for its tiny size. You can't just plug in a keyboard or network cable. Out of the box, it runs TensorFlow on the camera feed, and you can preview it in your web browser. This web UI is powered by MotionEye, a web interface for monitoring camera feeds. You can do things like set up a time-lapse camera, take pictures when motion is detected, or identify interesting things like birds, people, or heck, even my cell phone. Anyways, the CM4 gets really hot with TensorFlow running, so I logged into the PyCam with SSH and disabled TensorFlow with the commands you see here. After that, I re-added the camera to MotionEye and the Pi ran quite a bit cooler without object detection running. I like seeing more camera-focused products for the CM4 because even though it gets toasty, it has more than double the performance of the Pi Zero 2W while being just as small. I'd love to see someone put a Pi Cam and C4 directly on a telescope for some astrophotography. But now we come to it, the board to end all boards. Well, at least if you love USB. And that's because this board has not one, but one, two, three USB hubs built in. I mean, I get it. Almost every video where I show off a new board that has just one USB 2 port, the first few comments are, but where are the USB 3 ports? Well, I think Yu Gear heard you, because in addition to the eight USB 3 ports on the back, there's a mini PCI Express slot and an M.2 NVMe slot, all driven through USB 3. In some ways, that's not as performance optimized as a design using a PCI Express bridge like you might remember on Radsys Taco Board, but it is easier to make sure everything works out of the box. No extra drivers are needed. And earlier I mentioned that you can boot a Raspberry Pi from an NVMe drive now. But the caveat is that you can't boot from NVMe if the board has a PCI Express switch like the Taco. Well, the Pi Gear Nano gets around that problem by running its NVMe SSD over an internal USB port, meaning booting from it works great, since it's just a USB drive. So with this board, I could conceivably set up a 4G wireless modem, boot it from an NVMe SSD, and plug in eight USB devices. So, yeah. I'm gonna do that. <sighs> all right, so after doing all that and spending some time using it, I did find a few issues. First of all, you can't power up an infinite number of USB devices when you're running the board off USB-C power. You can hook up a better power adapter to the power terminals here and supply anywhere between 7 to 30 volts of power. Also, for some reason, when I tried booting the system off the NVMe drive, I ran into about 90 seconds of delays until the system was up and running. I'm not sure why, but I did see a few errors during startup. I could use the system as usual after it booted, though, so maybe it's my own fault. Not sure. 
I also had a little fun playing a game of Will It Raid with all eight of these USB flash drives. I put them in RAID 0 and ran some benchmarks. The crazy thing is I could get almost 300 megabytes per second of sequential read performance across all these drives, but it kind of fell off a cliff for anything else. You can only write about 24 megabytes per second or like two to three megabytes per second for small files. And that's using RAID 0, which is the best performing, but really the most risky RAID level. Nobody ever said cheap flash drives in RAID were a good idea, except maybe Redshirt Chef, I, I don't know. But there are plenty of other features on this board too, like all this I.O. on the back, including CAN bus and a one-wire connection. UU Gear maintains a tool called PG Nano that lets you control everything on this board from the command line or even this neat little web UI. The UI works pretty well and lets me control this tiny little stoplight on the back. Oh, and how could I miss this cute little built-in buzzer? Well, actually that could get really annoying. Anyways, the Pi Gear Nano is put together well and I love how they support the hardware with software and a good user manual. They didn't just throw some hardware over the wall without any thought towards practical use. I asked why this board has all the USB in the world and they said a client needed it for some sort of industrial battery testing. When Yu Gear decided to mass produce the board, they had a decision to make. Do they drop half the USB ports and save a little money or leave them? I mean, the answer is pretty obvious. Who wouldn't want eight USB 3 ports? They also designed a pretty nice enclosure too. Right before recording the video, they sent over this case design, so I printed it and slapped it all together. My 3D printing abilities aside, it's nice to see a well-rounded case design too. Now, what else is going on in the CM4 world? Oh, remember the CM4 Retro Lite I talked about last year? Well, Stoned Edge is back and it looks like he and his friend have finally finished it and they seem to have spared no expense. The thing looks like a Switch Lite, except of course it's not. It runs RetroPie and the finish quality on the thing is brilliant. And since it runs on a Compute Module 4, it can run practically any game up to the PSP and Nintendo 64 era without any problems. And it even has a docked mode. Usually people stop on a project like this once they have a working prototype, but this goes a lot further. I, I mean, look at the thing. They even designed a custom battery and this custom splash screen, though I'm sure if they tried selling anything, Nintendo would have a word about it. The rest of the community hasn't been getting much rest either. There are a bunch of other boards I haven't even mentioned. There's RetroFlag's new GPI Case 2, which is looking pretty slick. There's RGR's Mini SS main board that fits in a mini Sega Saturn case. There's a massive relay control board from Aljaz to Torque, and Will Wang is back with his absolutely tiny Pi 4 cluster hat, which is like a CM4 cluster, but for ants. And in addition to those boards, I'm also planning on more in-depth videos on a few, like the one everyone's been emailing, tweeting, and messaging me about, this Access Interceptor board. It has five SATA ports, an ATX power header, four Ethernet ports, and more, and I'm partnering up with someone to make a really fun build video for this. There's also the BLI KVM, or BLI KVM, which is like the Pi KVM I reviewed earlier this year, but it's built with the Compute Module 4. I'm gonna see how my dad sets it up at his radio station, and maybe that'll be the first video we post on our new Gearling Engineering channel. Finally, I have a new industrial PC from Lincoln Bins, and I plan on talking more about what it takes to make an industrial Raspberry Pi in a future video. So subscribe, and until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.